Lonnie, what's happening, brother? How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you guys? I'm doing so well. You know, we go back a minute, and it's it's such a it's so much fun to be able to to catch up on the net, on the internet, and I, I you happen to be the owner and operator of one of my favorite places in the world, which is a place that I, it was one of my first jobs out of college in the industry, and it, that is the Boston Shaker, an absolute institution. So I mean, besides where you work, I just want to thank you for coming on because I, I smile whenever I see you. <laughs> Same, Sammy. Thanks for having me on. I just want to know, you know, my first question for you is, given that the Boston Shaker is a is a is an institution in my mind, in the industry of, of drinks and everything that, that relates to drinks, can you tell us a little bit about the store for folks that haven't been there in Somerville? Um, what 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 that store means to the community and what it's meant for the past few years and and how did you get to own that that sweet sweet piece of land? How'd that happen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I'm Lonnie. I'm the owner and offer of the Boston Shaker, uh, which Sammy is and it's part of his alma mater. He has definitely uh, been part of the team of cocktail consultants here. We are a Boston institution. The Boston Shaker has been around. Uh, we're actually in our twelfth year. Uh, we started as a really small pop-up, uh, kind of designed for home bartenders, and have grown into one of the nation's premier cocktail supply shops. Uh, we've certainly um, carried all the basics with cocktails when we started, kind of with the Renaissance in 2006, really. The founder, Adam Lantome, my mentor, friend, and uh, who I purchased the business from uh, in 2018. Uh, really started his cocktail passion at the, the bars that were starting to get into craft cocktails in the city. Uh, his local hangout was the B-Side Lounge. That was, he was a regular there, and that's in Hampshire Street in Cambridge. And that was one of the iconic bars that was starting to do cocktails right. So legendary bartenders that have been written about in all these books. Misty Kalpkin, Jackson Cannon, uh, Dave um, from The Automatic. You know, all these guys really started there, and girls really got their start at the B-side, and were making classics again. You know, Jackery's, Perry Gistas, Fresh Man, you know, Manhattan's, Dirt Up Right. And so Adam was working in tech at the time, and he found this bar and really fell in love with the drinks and wanted to make them at home. So his, his vision was starting a cocktail supply shop that allowed people to find the right tools and ingredients uh, to make drinks at home, you know, the right way. And at the time, you know, in the re real renaissance, there was still only – you know, two bidders on the market. It was really hard to find the right tools, so that's why he started the shop. And the Boston Shaker was just a pop-up in Union Square in Somerville, and we're now in our, our brick and mortar, our flagship store here in Somerville. And yeah, as the community goes, this has been a clubhouse for not only bartenders uh, throughout the years to get supplies, catch up, share new drink ideas, really ride this amazing wave of cocktails that we've had since 2008. Um, you know, when the shop started. And it's been an amazing community of communication, support. You know, we help people find the right jobs, help people find apartments. It's just a really uh, nice uh, kind of ground for people to really meet each other. With what's going on right now, we've completely changed, you know, obviously with restaurants not as active. We're still here trying to find uh, our community of bartenders, but we've certainly turned to the home bartender. And with a nation at home, we're helping through email and phone, uh, a whole nation make their favorite drinks. And whether it's getting the right tools and ingredients or just offering that consultation, uh, our community has grown to the entire nation. So we are certainly uh, the nation's neighborhood cocktail supply shop these days. Well said, man. I mean, you, I, think, yeah, I think you answered it, absolutely. I mean, you talked a little bit about the B side, which is a deep cut. And I think one that's trying to play like, like Boston area cocktail poker one of the few things, like the, the few things you need to have happen for you is like Brother Cleve has to make you a Manhattan. Uh, Gaz yeah. Regan has to put his finger in your Negroni. Yeah. Yeah, you need to, and, and I think you need to come to the Boston Shaker and taste a few bitters. And I, yeah. that's, that's my relationship with the Boston Shaker. It was before I started working there many years ago. I'm curious because you get these people that walk in all the time that are – either don't know where they are or they do, but they're not sure how to start. 
making cocktails at home. What are, what are some of the most common mistakes that people make when they're trying to like recreate the cocktails they love at home? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We're again, most, we have everybody walking through the doors that are uh, from novice and just getting started to, you know, some professionals uh, and we're adaptable to everybody. So I would say for the people walking in the doors, you know, this is a shop of wonders or even looking at all the different tools, supplies, books, and ingredients. It's definitely overwhelming. Um, but we really boil it down to, we focus on, you know, not only do we curate the best tools and ingredients or just the right tools, um, we're really trying to get people into the right techniques. And we kind of boil down the whole cocktail universe. Uh, as we'll talk about today, there's a whole cheeky tropical side to it. There's classic stirred, there's classic shaken, and there's modern drinks. We really boil it down to the families of drinks, and all those boil down to basically shaken or stirred are the main two main uh, techniques to use when making cocktails. We're actually going to cover a nice one today, swizzling, which is kind of a, a combination of both of those. But when shaking or stirring, uh, we have everything arranged in the three major categories. So when you walk in the door, we're able to kind of segment the, uh, what you need to start making the drink, which is measuring. Uh, what you need to combine everything, shaking or stirring, and your final step, which is straining. So we carry a wide range of tools from for measuring. Uh, we carry what are called jiggers or measuring devices. And we carry all the professional and classic ones that are easy to use at home. Uh, I would say the most common is this Japanese-style jigger. This is the one you're going to see behind most professional bars and on the home bar. Uh, it's great because it has all the measurements in one. Uh, in the past, you would have multiple jiggers. They had a kind of conical or cone shape and you would need different jiggers for different measurements. Here you have a one ounce on the small side, and the larger side is two ounces, one over two, which are your major spirit measurements. And on the inside of the small side, you have half, three quarter, and a one ounce measurement. And on the large side, you have an ounce and a half line, and then two. So you have half, three quarter, one, ounce and a half, and two, all in one tool. So one tool to clean, one tool to use when making cocktails. So. Highly recommend measuring. You may go to bars and restaurants that don't measure, but at home, if you're following recipes, there are mostly in ounces. It's great to measure in order to get, ensure balance and uh, good quality tasting cocktails. So, got to start with a good measuring device. Another one you might run into that we've carried for a long time is this OXO measuring cup. Kind of a fun one. We have a unique history with this. Uh, we are certainly one of the top sellers of this as we've been carrying it for uh, over 10 years. OXO specifically reached out to us and we're wondering why we sold so many of this measuring cup, which is normally a kitchen utensil. Uh, this is just a measuring cup that has lines on the inside that each have ounces, up to two ounces on the right, and then tablespoon as well, so kitchen tool. And we mentioned it was for jiggering because, or measuring too. When you set this down on the table, it's flat. You don't have to hold it in your hand, and unlike this conical shape, you don't have to fill all the way to the top, you can just fill the line. So it's easier to use, you can just set it down and pour your liquid right in there. So they asked us, you know, what we would change about it since we carried it for so long, what we've sold so many. And at the time, it didn't have a three-quarter ounce measurement, which is very important in cocktails. And they shifted to the new batch, and sure enough, there was a three-quarter ounce line in there. So our little shop has been influential for even larger cocktail supply companies. So measuring is important. You know, most things in ounces, you want to get that. And when you measure, you want to measure into a Boston shaker. This is the one tool to rule them all. We carry a cobbler style or a three-piece shaker that a lot of people assume is kind of the standard still, but this is the standard cocktail shaker of today, and this is the tool you want on the home bar or you'll see most professionals using. It's two pieces. So you actually get a 16-ounce heat-treated and reinforced pint glass. This is great for stirring. Again, glass is traditional stirring because not only can you see what you're doing, it's pretty quiet. Oh, I chose the longest spoon I could find. Uh, it's really quiet and it's nice to elegantly stir in the cocktail. It also doubles, obviously just makes your shaker as well. When you cap your 16 ounce pint glass with a larger 20 ounce tin, you create the Boston shaker. And this is the best tool to use when shaking a cocktail, because uh, not only it's gonna create a great seal, but it's easy to open. And actually real briefly, I'll just show you, a lot of people when walking in uh, the shop for the first time, the biggest hurdle is this shaker. You know, it's, if they haven't used it before, there's a little bit of a step. And that is when you seal it, you don't align it vertically. You actually want it off to one flat or flush side. You just give it a tap. That kind of locks it in. And you want to stir for 20 seconds, but you want to shake for 10 seconds. You want to stir for twice as long, but shake for 10 seconds. This is going to get nice and cold and frosty, but this glass is going to be nice and sealed. 
When you shake, the metal gets cold. It seals the shaker by creating a vacuum, and so that you can't just pull this top or the, the glass off. You definitely do not want to hit this against a hard surface to, uh, to loosen it. What you want to do is keep the splatter flush side towards you, facing your, hold it real high in your non-dominant hand, just right underneath the tenure. And just like you're clapping, you want to bring your hands together and just tap that, wherever this gap is on the tin, just tap the gap so you can loosen the glass. So the traditional glass on tin Boston shaker is the original and the most used. We also carry the tin on tin version. Same setup, same design, same method, but lighter weight, won't break, and in the end, a lot easier to open because it's tin on tin. So when you're measuring, you're measuring the Boston shaker, you can shake or stir in here. And the final step there is straining, and that's done with a Hawthorne strainer. A Hawthorne strainer is actually an original invention from Boston. This is the original Hawthorne, patent 1895, and it was named after the Hawthorne luncheon and bar in down Avery Street in Boston. So this is a no prong, and it fits right on top here. So if you were done shaking your drink, you can build on the small side that you want to strain from the big tin or the big side. And if you were straining, you would just kind of tip slowly, and that strainer is going to hold everything back. And we have different options from the standard, your Toyota Camry here, it fits right on there. It'll fit anything really, it'll fit the pints as well. We have some revised four prongs. You can see this is kind of an upgraded version. Same thing, fits right on top, fit it, adjust to fit. And your coil here is really what's straining everything out. So uh, when people are making drinks at home, it's nice to not have the ice in there uh, melting while you're uh, trying to enjoy your fresh cocktail. So when people walk in, we really boil it down to measuring, find the right tool to get all those ounces measured. Shaking or stirring with the Boston shaker. And your final step, straining. Are really only the tools you need. And once they kind of get that down and all these shaking or stirring techniques apply to all drinks, you stop trying to memorize a thousand cocktails and you apply the technique that you know uh, to the recipe that you're reading. I feel like I'm back in class. I love it, Lonnie. Thank you so much, man. You know, yeah. I think um, you, you, you touched on a few different objects, the jigger, and you had a couple options, the Hawthorne strainer, you had a couple options. You pulled out the longest spoon east of the Mississippi. I mean, y'all have like 10 different bar spoons out there. I'm sure that for folks that are newer to making cocktails that um, either are close to your store or maybe are interested in going to the store and picking up something uh, virtually, because uh, I know y'all do, uh, deliver all over, all over the states. How do, you, how do you guide someone towards the right spoon? I mean, how do you guide someone? I have a, you know, I still have the same citrus squeezer I bought like 10 years ago from the store. I mean, and, and I, I know that there is the right shaker and the right spoon and the right jigger for everybody. But for someone that's new to this, how do you, how do you guide them? Great. Yeah, actually great insight. Again, again, there's a lot of options here. We always carry the right tools, the same ones that at home or professional would find comfortable and easy to use. Nothing that's gimmicky or doesn't work. So you're always going to get the right tool from here. The spoon specifically and the other tools, it's kind of like a chef's knife. It's a personal preference. It's what works for you. The main difference that we carry are spoons that have either a twisted, I don't know if you can tell this is a twisted barrel, or a smooth barrel. Specifically for these, uh, the spoon is such a versatile tool. Obviously, it's designed to stir in a mixing glass. It has this great little dish that is soft, so it's quiet when stirring around there. It has a twisted handle bar spoon that makes your grip easier, and it has a nice little weight on the end of it so it's easy to spin. So these are designed to be very functional and easy to use, but some people want either a smoother barrel, maybe a larger dish. Uh, this actual bowl or dish on the spoon can be used as a measurement. It's called a bar spoon. This spoon happens to have a bar spoon that is kind of angled here, so it's meant to pour liquid into there and get an efficient bar spoon and just pour right in. But I would say um, it's kind of the, the feel of it, I would say that right now the most popular spoon on the market is the twisted handle, what they call the teardrop or the raindrop. And it's just really nice. You can stir in here. I use this a lot of times to crack ice. If you hold like an ice there, this is a great ice cracker to get cracked or crushed ice to put in there. Smaller pieces are nicer to stir with. They melt faster. And a lot of people when making highballs or long drinks with soda, will actually pour the soda down the spiral of the, the shaft to mix that soda from the bottom up. So a really versatile tool. 
explain the differences, but we have all the tools available for everybody to test and try to find the one that feels right to them. Same thing with, you know, the Boston Shaker. We obviously carry the Classic, but for most people getting into it, the tin on tin is always going to be easier. It's a lot easier to open, never going to break, and a little more easy uh, or approachable for someone just getting into it. So we judge their experience, put in the right tools, let them test it out, and then hopefully we can find, obviously, the right gear for them. Awesome. Um, I'm curious about, you know, you've, you've run through some tools. I have a bunch of tools around me, including my own spoon that, again, I brought the shaker a few months ago. I'm curious, um, you guys also sell a ton of syrups. You sell shrubs, you sell syrups, you sell bitters. The, syr the syrups that we're going to be touching upon for our tiki class that's coming up in the next four weeks, uh, you know, we're specifically using orgeat and we're using passion fruit syrup. And, you know, I, I, I always came from bar programs where you pride, you, you always pride yourself on your ability to make everything in-house. Whenever you can, if you can make it, you should make it. And that means I make my own simple syrup, I make my own honey syrup, but there are a few things that I just can't be bothered to make because it, it's just too much work. One more thing for me to do behind the bar. A lot of great bar programs still buy gourmet-level syrups. I have a passion fruit syrup that I got from uh, from from a company, a small company in uh, in Montreal, because I can't find passion fruits, man. It's a nightmare. Uh, yeah. And that, which is not to say that all syrups are created equally. I know you have a few different brands. I'd love for you to just walk us through. What do you look for? I mean, I'm sure people come knocking on your door trying to sell their wares all the time. What do you look for in a good orgeat? What do you look for in a good passion fruit syrup? And what separates all the different brands. Do you get what you pay for? You know, is it all about the, the ingredients, et cetera? Yeah, great insight. Again, yeah, right? the shaker, we carry everything but the booze. So we have a wide range of syrups, flavored syrups, shrubs, and mixers to help people make those classic cocktails at home. Not everything calls for just simple syrup. And if they want to make a tropical or bright tiki drink, they're going to call for, yeah, some of the more complex ones that we have. Uh, First, I'll touch on, you know, how we choose, you know, we test, try, taste, vet everything in the shop before we sell it. Uh, myself, my, my savvy sipping cocktail consultants, uh, we do try quite a few products. We get a lot of new vendors. Uh, I would say right now, you know, compared to when the shop started, there's been an explosion of small batch bitters companies, small batch syrup companies. So we've had the privilege of trying some really delicious stuff. Right now, we've boiled our core line down to what we consider some of the best syrups. Uh, I'll start with BG Reynolds. Um, this is Blair Reynolds' company. Uh, he's out of Portland, uh, Oregon. And he's been a friend of the shop for, you know, when we started with Adam. But he's probably, um, in this company, of uh, tropical and tropical tiki syrups, is one of the first on the market. So they were one of the first to bring out a passion fruit, an orja, cinnamon syrup. He actually recreated Don's Mix number one and two, which are kind of spice and grapefruit. So uh, when cocktails at home first started, yeah, finding passion fruits, toasting almonds, crushing them, you know, mixing them with that, you know, there's a process for sure to make a lot of these more complex, especially tiki syrups. Um, so with Blair, we get uh, what we think are some of the best flavors. Uh, some of the longer lasting ones, again, most of these products, if you're not making tiki drinks every day, last a long time in the fridge, but... Blair Reynolds passion fruit is just that. Uh, this is bright passion fruit um, juice with cane sugar. And so it's just all natural. It has a really uh, tart brightness. It's going to have a juicy kind of tropical flavor to a lot of rich rums. And passion fruit in general is one of our favorites. We also carry uh, passion fruit from Yes Cocktail Syrups. These guys are out of California. And they're using California-grown passion fruit syrups. Again, these guys are dedicated. Basically, they're... Um, you know, their first batch, they're focused on locally sourced, entirely all natural ingredients, just to make the best cocktails. So the syrups we look at are usually designed for cocktails specifically. And again, this is made from passion fruit, water, and cane sugar. It literally says that's it. So all natural, great tasting. Um, and that's going to be, yes, syrups out of California. We have one more out of California. And that's going to be our small ham foods here. We also carry their passion fruit in Orgeat. And again, all natural, um, going to last in the fridge, be delicious when mixing cocktails, and it's going to save you a lot of time 
uh, and making them. These are all reasonably priced, they're $12. I think the most expensive for the larger bottles is 16. Um, so we carry Orgeat and passion fruit. We have seen, you know, especially with cheeky tropical drinks, always been fun. And, you know, we have a lot of books that go into history if you want to read more about the history of the kind of mid-century uh, evolution of tiki tropical. But more people have been walking in the door asking about Orgeat and passion fruit than ever before. Uh, I think tastes are going to the summertime for sure, but it's tiki anytime. And they really want... Uh, easy to use, delicious drinks that last a while. So uh, we have a wide range, at least three options of each, uh, passion fruit and orange coming from that. This customer right now calling to get some advice. <laughs> so with the syrups, quite a few out there, but we may, we do the work for the people and making sure the best things are on the shelves. We um, we recognize the, the phone ringing, but there are some other sounds happening that we don't quite recognize. Phil, do you have a question for uh, for our man, Lonnie? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious. What's, what's with all the honking? You got some sort of party going on out there? Oh, you guys should hear the honking. Yeah, actually, uh, we're part of a neighborhood coalition for the Black Lives Matter. And every oh. day from 6 to 6.30, uh, we all hold signs and, uh, a lot of them say honk as you drive by. So we have oh. some signs in the window right now. So, yeah, there's a little bit of a gathering going on outside, but it's every day. Uh, right here in our neighborhood. Uh, we were really cool uh, neighbors, uh, both businesses and people. So, yeah, yeah, a little party going outside. <laughs> I love Very that. Cool. I, I, I yeah. couldn't have, you know, I moved from Davis Square basically to Brooklyn, which is the Davis Square of New York. So it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see that the community is still strong and fighting for what's important. Absolutely. And again, we're, you know, we opened with phase three, you know, obviously a lot of change going on. Um, we're still promoting in-store pickups, but our community and the support from the people walking in, checking in on the business and, um, you know, checking in with them. Uh, I think there's uh, such a friendship around here. So yeah, we have a great community here and, uh, we're a small shop. So it really means a lot to us. Yeah. Um, so, awesome. I you, have a you, lot of ingredients here. Um, a lot of them have a few extra techniques. So oh, go ahead. I was just, I was gonna say you 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 walked us through some of the incredible brands that you have and a, a few different syrups. Um, I wanted to talk about ice if you're ready. Do you have anything else to talk about in terms of syrups? No, I got I've chosen a couple for today's cocktail. Some of my favorites. Um, we carry so yeah we carry syrups, bitters, you know all these mugs. So I've set out the different syrups. I'll go over the ones that we're gonna uh, talk about the taste notes, you know, the ones we're gonna use. Uh, but we are going to be using, we have a wide range of bitters as well. And a lot of people aren't always looking to make alcoholic drinks. Um, they want a refreshing, tasty cocktail, or a non-alcoholic cocktail. I got some mocktail. So I would just want to, I want to point out that between bitters and soda, these bright syrups and fresh juices, you know, we carry anything but the booze. So we talk with people a lot about just making um, refreshing summertime drinks, uh, alcoholic or not. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. we have... One of the things we have is some cool ice products. So yeah, let me know if you're ready for ice. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's on everyone's mind right now. Everyone's talking about ice. I, uh, you know, if you're in the business, you know that like, bars like the Aviary in Chicago and um, at one point in, in New York, they had um, more than 30 different types of ice that they used for all their like really boutique cocktails. And, and, you know, most people at home, we got one kind of ice, all right? Like, we're not yeah. – we, the, 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 we, we all got the same damn tray that we got from Sir La Tab, you know, five years ago. It's going yeah. strong, you know? We're not, we're not rocking yeah, the sure. mini fridge, little tiny guy anymore. How do I – I mean, whenever you look if – if you peek over the well, over the bar into the well of, like, your average tiki bar – They've got at least three different types of ice. You know, they got big ice, they got their shaking ice, they have maybe pebble ice. How do you, if I just want to make a tiki drink at home, and I and I can't use just my regular ice, how do I how do I get from A to B? How do I get that cool pebble ice? How do I get that crushed ice? Yeah. And, and the second part of that question is, why do I need to use crushed ice for a tiki drink? Why is that important? Why why can't I just use my regular ass ice? Yeah, exactly. I would say, you know, when we talk about cocktails here at the Shaker, you can't talk about drinks without ice. You know, ice is 
one of the ingredients, whether you it's called for in the cocktail or not, they're still going to tell you to shake or stir. And by that alone, the ice is doing three major jobs. It not only has to mix all the ingredients in your cocktail by stirring it around or shaking it around and a lot of action. It is not only going to chill everything to make it nice and cold when you shake or stir or put it in the glass, uh, but most importantly, the ice is there to dilute your cocktail. Uh, ice is the way to balance your drinks. That's why we shake things for a specific amount of time or feel and stir. It's to make sure that the balance between the water, the spirit, the sugar, bitters, or possibly juices in there are all blended equally and give you one uniform flavor as opposed to all these different notes. So ice is the vehicle to make sure your cocktail is correct. For tiki specifically, you kind of get into a newer type of ice. Yeah, you can grow to your door in your fridge and you can get those half moons of ice and things like that. We carry a wide range of ice trays here for people looking to improve their ice program. I would say those old trays that you have, you know, the white, you know, the ones you twist to kind of get them out. All those, including the ice, the door of your fridge, they're designed to make ice as fast as possible um, and crank it out. So when you look at it, the way to tell good ice from bad uh, is kind of the clarity of it. It's, uh, when you're looking at it, the more transparent, the more dense, the less air in there. And those little small trays and half moons are just going to be totally opaque. So it's going to be uh, less dense. So when you start shaking your story, it's going to break apart faster. But that's all fine here because the first method for tiki, a lot of them call for crushed ice. So if you don't have the crushed ice thing on your door and you have one of these trays, we're going to make some crushed ice right now just to show you how to do that. Yeah, give it a little tap so you make sure it's all good. So. so we're going to use some basic ice that we got from our ice trays. We actually use the Tavolo ice trays, and we carry a new luxury brand of Peak. So these are ones that you would put in your freezer. They freeze overnight. But they'll give you a really nice solid cube. In fact, they'll give you a cube that's a little more dense than maybe you would have otherwise, which is great for shaking and stirring, uh, and also fun when we start cracking. So these are the perfect cube trays, and uh, yep, we're going to start cracking this ice. So I have with me what's called a Lewis bag or an ice crushing bag. This is just a canvas bag. We get this one from Cocktail Kingdom. Uh, we've had a long time, so a lot of ice crushing. And I have an ice mallet, uh, the Schmallet, also from Cocktail Kingdom. This is an old uh, carpenter mallet, kind of redesigned um, to crush ice. And it's made of wood, so it's going to be nice to your wood surfaces. So again, this is designed to crush on any kind of hard surface. So I'll take my bag and say this was the ice tray that I kind of emptied from my freezer. I'm just going to put some of this ice in the, uh, the Lewis bag here, carefully. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay, sometimes it's casually as in the TV. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks for your patience there. So I put all that ice in here. And so that's like an ice tray in the bottom of your bag. You want to hold this pretty tightly. You can tie it using the string. But I usually just do this twist method, just kind of seal it in there. And I hold the bag, place it on your hard surface, take your ice mallet, and you want to start using the narrow, the small side. And we'll finish with the broad side here. But with your bag twisted and just on the ground, you just want to give this some wax. And honestly, it gets the stress out. Nice to give it another twist once in a while to keep the ice sealed, but also kind of move the ice towards the bottom of the bag. That way it keeps it all together. Work the hammer out, maybe get another twist. Tight. Feeling pretty fine, so now I'm going to flip to the broad side just to give it a nice even pound. Now you have a bag full of just cracks or crushed kind of snow cone ice. And we'll put that ice right here. We're gonna put it in our other ice tray so we can make our drink with it later, but I'll show you this is kind of like kind of like snow. It's just a small cracked or crushed ice. And the reason for this with tiki drinks is mostly because tiki drinks, whether you like it or not, are usually pretty strong. They, know, they don't follow the three ounce rule that most cocktails do. They have a lot of juice, a lot of rum, some other kind of tropical flavors in there. So the point of cracked or crushed ice is going to give you a drink that you can have resting on ice for a while, and it's really going to kind of like a mint julep kind of uh, melt and dilute as you drink it. So it's going to start rich and strong, but as you drink the cocktail, it's going to get nice and mellow. 
and also give us a nice kind of frosty exterior to our glass. So we're going to do practice cracked or crushed ice today. Normally you want to just use those whole cubes when shaking or stirring. You don't have to crack or crush your ice. Keep the ice cube as normal. Shake for 10 seconds, stir for 20 seconds. Perfect. I, you, yeah. I just watching you crush that ice. Just it, 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 it was very cathartic for me. I uh, feel great. You can't over crush the ice. And we carry, you know, we carry large cubes and small cubes. So if you want a big, perfect, clear cube in your glass for your old-fashioned Manhattan, you know, we have that as well. But any ice can be done, uh, can turn into this beautiful crushed ice. Hell yeah! So we've talked, we've talked syrups, we've talked about the ice. Um, before we get to the booze, I kind of want to talk about the vessel. Like, I think when people think about tiki drinks, they think about, I mean, they think about what, how, what they go into. I mean, I have a few really fun tiki mugs over here. You have, I see a ton of really cool vessels <laughs> in front of you. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about, um, you know, why we use these things sure. and, and, and the, the wide range that you have to offer? Absolutely. Yeah, we carry, I mean, we carry a wide range of glassware, and we have uh, your classic coops, your Manhattan glasses, old fashions, clear glass. But when it comes to Tiki Tropical, you know, the whole point is to kind of have fun. Not only to drink out of something that's visually exciting, uh, but you want to hold more of it. So our more, normal cocktail glasses are around six ounces, and we carry some larger eight ounces. You're going to start at least 12 ounces for each of these uh, cocktails. And that's going to give you a larger vessel for all that maybe cracked or crushed ice. Uh, but give you a little longer time to enjoy this on these hot summer days and on these porches. So, yeah, we just expanded our inventory. Uh, we carry everything from these fun uh, peacocks that you don't even need a straw. You can just kind of drink out of this one, you know. Uh, we have the classic tiki mugs, uh, the Easter Island kind of ones, uh, the unicorn. We do have the shore leaf tiki mug from shore leaf in South Boston. They're one of our favorite tropical tiki bars. Uh, I guess my favorite right now is the cactus. I love just putting a little hay straw on that one. But it's really, again, up to the user. You could use these for planters. You could store your pens and pencils in them. Uh, they're just to bring joy to the drinking experience. So we could, you could easily put this cocktail we're going to make, the swizzle, in any one of these. There's no rules. Just find your favorite tiki mug, the one that speaks to you, and that's what you should put your drink in. Do you have, um, yeah. you have 30 seconds on... Uh... On straws, I know that straws are a hot, yes. hot topic right now. I have a couple of, um, I have a long metal straw that I use in my tiki cups. I have my little tiny guy, my little spoon straw Absolutely. here for shorties. Um, I heard you yeah, talk about a straw. Can you walk us through straws one on one? Yeah, yeah, straws are important, especially when you have vessels that aren't normally meant to be brought to your. Uh, yeah, nobody's bringing this uh, maybe seashell up to them. So <laughs> straws allow you to get down to the cocktail. Let it sit and enjoy, especially when it's one of these giant volcano bowls that maybe you don't want to pick up. But we carry, uh, we've been promoting, you know, we uh, try to do reusable. So we don't carry plastic straws. We carry reusable steel straws from Cocktail Kingdom in five, seven, eight, and even the ones that have a little spoon at the bottom. And right now, for especially for tiki drinks, we're really loving these hay straws. These are literally made of wheat or stalks of hay. And they're cylindrical, and they're completely biodegradable, just like a decomposing piece of hay. Uh, they're awesome in tiki because they have that rattan kind of bamboo look, um, and we really like them. They don't they don't uh, get soggy like paper straws, and uh, we really like the hay straws right now. But we carry reusable uh, polypropylene, steel, and hay straws. So I'll be using some of these hay straws. Yeah, absolutely, in this cocktail. Awesome. We got the straws, we got the ice, we got the mugs, we got the syrups. I know people are thirsty at home. Um, I think we're ready to make a cocktail, baby. I mean, can you talk thirsty, about yeah. um, what do you? What I know you need a drink, babe. I mean, what 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 kind of? There's, I think you could say conservatively, if you were to start making tiki drinks um, regularly at home, that you would need like seven, eight, nine, ten different rums. There's there's a whole spectrum of flavor available in the category of rum. Um, what do you look for in a rum when you're making tiki drinks, and and what what role does cotton and reed rum fill for you? Yeah, you're right. There is, just like there's expanding worlds of 
cocktail supplies, ingredients, you know, the spirit world is also seeing a lot of new entries, a lot of new distilleries. Um, what I look for in rums, you know, if you read the recipe, first of all, it will most often make a suggestion. It's a say, instead of saying just rum, it might say light or dark rum, or sometimes it might say white or aged rum. And there's a big difference there because they're going to be unaged, which are brighter, more tropical, kind of uh, berry and even tart flavors in rums. Um, and then in the aged rum, you can get these darker kind of spice notes that really give a lot of depth to the cocktail. So if we're looking at rums, first reference the uh, recipe, but when shopping, certainly look for ones that are going to be maybe small batch or more local. You know, if you get a smaller batch product that's not a Bacardi and these kind of huge things, you're going to get a much better produced product in a much smaller volume. Uh, right now, we use cotton re rums in our cocktail classes. Um, we did in our real class and our virtual now. But I would say the the white rum really speaks to us just for the simple uh, kind of classics like the daiquiri. If you want a clean tasting drink that's just rum, lime, and sugar, you know the daiquiri is an amazing, refreshing cocktail that we have any time. Add soda, you turn it into a mojito, and I would certainly reach for the refreshing kind of bright tropical notes. Uh, the cottonry white rum for a really clean, bright daiquiri. If you're getting something in a little more rich with a little more spice, we're actually going to be using some Angostura bitters to have a lot of cinnamon, kind of brown uh, baking spice flavors. It's really nice to have a rum that has a little more character and body. And aging and oak is definitely going to do that. So the mellow rum here, as you can tell, comparing the white rum unaged here for bright and tropical to this mellow rum that's been aged, you can see the color really going to give us a nice, more spiced, uh, kind of a darker, funkier flavor, which is going to give more depth to your drink. You know, I would use this in shaken and stirred, like rum old fashions, old Cubans, kind of great, um, richer, darker drinks. And I would certainly reach for a white rum with brighter mojitos, the daiquiris, um, kind of refreshing drinks that you would want to have, uh, maybe long drinks like in a pitcher. Uh, but today we're going to be using both because we want both of these flavors to come through. Uh, we're going to focus on a cocktail that is a little different than standard. It's a different style, and it's called a swizzle style cocktail or a swizzle tiki drink. And if you guys are cool, I'm ready to jump into. Kind of yeah, let's do it, babe. Yeah, I'm excited. So let's do it. It's we're going to build it in the clear glass so everybody can see. But like I said, you can easily make this in any of the tiki mugs. Uh, it's not a problem. This swizzle glass kind of looks like a long pilsner. It's designed to hold crushed ice and a nice kind of close together so it'll frost up. And it's also tall and cylindrical, so we're gonna be able to make our cocktail in the glass. So for here, we're gonna have a few ingredients. I am gonna use both the cotton and reed uh, white and mellow rum. We're gonna use an ounce of those each. But I wanna feature the tropical syrups we were talking about earlier. So I have, I'm gonna use the Small Ham Foods Orjot, which is one of my favorite. Has a little more of that marzipan, Orange flower water, so a little more floral here. And for the passion fruit, we're going to be using Yes Cocktail Co. Passion Fruit. So I'm actually going to use a half ounce of each of these to give me the rich almondy flavor from the Orjat and the tart tropical kind of passion fruit, the brightness from here. So there are rums are light and dark. We got a tart and a rich rum, kind of balance out. And our juices are going to be the the usual suspects in the tiki world. Uh, here I have fresh squeezed lime juice. We do recommend you using fresh juice, so roll out your limes, cut them in half, juice them, use that juice, and then we have pineapple juice. We got lime and pine, passion fruit orgeat, and we're gonna use these rums. So to build this, we're gonna start in the glass. And so to start with a classic swizzle, we're actually gonna muddle some mint in there to give it kind of an evergreen, kind of menthol flavor. So I'm gonna say, you know, loves me, loves me not, in here with about seven, to 10 to more mint leaves, and really just fill the bottom of the glass uh, with some mint. I'm gonna muddle this with the sugars, both the passion fruit and the orgeat, so that we can get uh, kind of an infused simple syrup here. Anthony, where'd my muddler go? Uh, I'm gonna grab a muddler here real quick. <laughs> I might have a spare here, down here. The missing muddler. Got another muddler. There it so is. The thing with the muddler here is you basically want to press and turn. You don't want to shred the mint. You just kind of want to push it down in there. And like I said, we're going to add both a half ounce of our passion fruit and orgeat to kind of muddle with the mint. So we're kind of mixing our simple syrups together. So using my jigger, the small side, the line for the half ounce, 
going to pour some passion fruit up to the line and pour that right into my cocktail glass. Kind of hold it there for a second to make sure you get all that delicious tart passion fruit. So I have foods orange on. I do give this one a shake. You have a nice rich almond oil with the cane sugar and the rose water, the orange blossom water. Again, a half ounce. I'm going to pour that right in there. So it's the mint and the sugars right now. For the muddler, you just want to press and turn. You don't want to, you don't want to like uh, tear up the mint. You just kind of press it to release the menthol and kind of mix that all together so you have a slurry of mint and sugar. I just want to press that down to the bottom of the glass like that. You don't have to muddle it very long at all. Now we're ready to add our rest of our ingredients, and that's going to include the juices, both the lime and the pine, and the rums. And then we'll start topping with uh, ice and start swizzling. I am going to start with the syrups and sugar, or the juices first. You kind of start building with your lower, uh, least expensive ingredients, and we're going to finish with the rum, so we can make sure that we get the right amount. For lime juice, I'm going to match the simple syrup measurements, just a half ounce. I want a half ounce of lime, fill onto the lime in the one ounce side. Got that bright, uh, acidic, bright lime juice. And for the pineapple juice, this is our tropical delivery. I'm going to fill it all the way to the top here. I'm going to fill this up the full one ounce measurement to give you an ounce of pine. And obviously we'll have this recipe available for those to make it home. We're ready for the rums. I'm gonna do one ounce of each. Make sure it's blended and balanced. I love, yeah, again, that kind of uh, brighter, light molasses, but definitely some tart, bright berry flavors from the white rum, cotton reed. One ounce there. And then the mellow is gonna give us that depth and that uh, kind of rich, darker flavor. And again, I'm gonna do the same measurement, one ounce there. So not too complex, and that's it for ingredients. You know, certainly some tiki drinks can really get a long build. We actually wanted to feature both the syrups, so if you wanted, you could choose if you want to go maybe just passion fruit or orgeat. All right, I have all my ingredients in here. I'm ready for that crushed ice that we made earlier. Crushed ice is great again, because it's gonna be our mixer, our chiller, and most importantly, the diluter of this cocktail. It's going to make it nice and balanced. I fill this about three quarters of the way full with cracked or crushed ice. I'm going to take my swizzle stick, and this is kind of a unique tool to the Tiki universe. Again, this is a tropical, uh, basically a manual immersion blender that we're going to use to uh, mix this in the glass. We have multiple styles. We have the original uh, swizzle stick, which is actually grown from a tropical tree, the Bois tree. And it grows in a natural five-pronged pattern, the branch. And they trim that, and they sell it as a swizzle stick that you can use in the Martinique area or here. And we also carry a new one. This is actually a, one of our uh, regulars of the shop. is an ex-neurosurgeon and tiki fanatic, uh, Ron. And he's handmade a modern swizzle stick that has more propellers, so it makes swizzling a little easier. It's designed like this so it can actually sift through the ice. You want to get this thing almost all the way to the bottom of the glass. And just like you're starting to fire, you just want to roll this guy back and forth, up and down, whizzling your cocktail. It's mixing, it's chilling, and it is melting the ice to dilute the cocktail. So we're just going to get this probably about 10 seconds of swizzling, just to get everything mixed together, get it kind of nice and chill. Once it's mixed, now you're ready to top with ice. If you swizzle a lot of that ice down, it's lost a lot of its height or volume. And kind of just hold it so you don't spill it everywhere like I do. Top it with crushed ice. And this cocktail is done, but we're going to do one final step, and that's the garnish. And in the garnish, it's, again, with Tiki Tropical, you want to have fun. It's about presentation, aroma, and that experience you get when you come down to the drink, even before you take your first sip. So a lot of that aroma comes from these aromatic bitters. I have a mil We have a million here at the shop. You're welcome to use grapefruit, cinnamon, uh, uh, persimmon, and we have so many different lemon lime ones, but Angostura is the grandfather of them all, and it gives that nice cinnamon note. It has a dot, dasher style top, so you just want to invert this over the glass and bounce. And every time you bounce, it's going to give a nice little dash. You basically want to create a nice kind of uh, brownish, reddish crown of bitters over the top of this drink to give it somewhat of a nice look and garnish. And then for kind of look and flavor, we're going to use some of these pineapple fronds, since there's pineapple juice in this cocktail. We're going to use a couple of these fronds just to create a more tropical islandy vibe. And then mint is always fragrant, and since we have mint at the bottom of this glass, take your mint sprig, you know, if you have some garden mint, or get it from the store. You can slap it or just kind of wake it up, the menthol, 
give it that real, yeah, real fragrance. And just stick that guy kind of right there as your garnish to go complement the greenery that you have on the top here. And your final step is the straw. This would be really hard to drink out of if you just try to upend it. So we do have the disposable hay straws. I like to take two for easy sipping. We want to get that guy right there on the edge. So here we have the cotton reed rum swizzle. Again, this is with those tropical syrups, the passion fruit, the orgeat, both the cotton reed white and mellow rums. We've got a nice topping of Angostura on there for everybody to enjoy on the porch. Or me. Later. <laughs> Well done, man. That looks fantastic. You've done yeah. it before. Oh, man. Bring, bring that closer to the camera. I want to see that. My kind of summer drink of the moment, for sure. I've been, it's so easy to make in the glass. Crushed ice, you know, it's actually fun to make after, you know, you just pound away. And you really can just, uh, especially if you have a few friends in the backyard, you don't need all the extra shakers and things. Get the glassware going. Get your ingredients in there. Top of the ice. Do a little swizzle. Could you uh, could you walk the the cocktail to the camera so we can get a, an up close shot oh, of that? Absolutely. Yeah, Let's sure. check that out. I want to see that. Can you guys see here? Is this okay? Oh yeah. Let me zoom so in you there. You got the mint in the bottom, which will be there when you guys get to there. You have the tropical juices and passion fruit syrups. And again, if you wanted, you could do a float of the rum instead of the bitters. But it's nice to kind of mix everything together. I love it, man. That looks fantastic. Oh. Ooh. It is delicious. And again, <laughs> easy to get these tiki mugs. They'll hold the volume very well. You've, uh, you've, you've answered our questions. You've walked us through the tools. You've walked us through the syrups and, and what the Boston Shaker can offer to every living being, uh, drinker or not. I, now that I feel like I've successfully lulled you into a, into a false state of, of, of confidence and you have a drink in front of you. I want to know if you're ready for the lightning round. I think I'm ready. <laughs> All up. Taylor and Taylor, white lightning round. Um, here we go. White lightning. <laughs> no wrong answer. Strong, the strong questions. I want to shoot these, these, uh, these questions, all right? Quick, quick, first off your top of your head. First question. It's the, it's the spirit's apocalypse. All the, every distillery in the world is gone, except for no. five distilleries that you can save. You can only save five distilleries around the world. It can be, you know, it can be brandy, rum, whiskey, gin, whatever you want, but you can only save five different ones. What are those five distilleries that you save? That is a good question and a very hard one. I have a personal relationship with distilleries. I, before purchasing and operating the Boston Shaker and mentoring a random, I ran a small craft distillery in South Boston. Uh, I actually worked at Grand Ten Distilling, and we produced Medford Rum and a few other craft spirits like Wireworks Gin. And so very dear to my heart in that I actually did my first spirit production, tasting, and learned everything I know today about uh, really hands-on spirit production. So Grand Ten Distilling, South Boston, great distillery, local, easy choice. Uh, while I'm at it, you know, I always say buy local. So if we stick to New England, let's put cotton and reed on there. I've been, we've been loving this white rum. Right now, personally, I drink, I buy limes and I buy gin and rum. So I make daiquiris and I make gimlets and I will top with soda water if I want to make long drinks. So rum is my go-to spirit. So delicious rum here. So Grand Ten cotton and reed. If I could think worldly, I definitely need a scotch in there. Um, I enjoy smoky scotches uh, just to sip or as ingredients, so I feel like we definitely need, obviously, one from Scotland. Uh, not too smoky. I'm going to go with Cragamore Scotch, which I think is a distillery of its own. Ooh. Actually, I'll say, uh, yeah, Cragamore. Uh, Irish or Scotch whiskey. Irish whiskey. Uh, wow. Let's go with Teeling, just to have that one in the books. Uh, I, I love my rums. I'm not, you know, I know there's a lot of great vodkas out there. I'm not really thinking about that right now. Uh, if I had to go to other worldly, oh, Mezcal. I'm going to need some Del Maguey. So for my rums, I'm going to be great with Grand Ten, Cotton Reed. Got my Cragamore Scotch. I got my Chilean Irish Whiskey. And I got my Del Maguey Mezcal. Well done. I think you Thank covered you. the whole That's like a little bigger. Yeah. These, 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 this is a lightning round that makes you think. 
Rare trade I think it's actually the first time we got an Irish whiskey as an answer. Yeah, I, I, it's partial to me. I like Irish, I like whiskey gingers with Irish whiskey, whiskey ginger ales, a lot of eggs to store up. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, it's one of those cure alls you can't, can't forget about. It. But Kind of Reed also makes a few other products, so by choosing that distillery, I also round out my poor, my pro portfolio with them. So. Of course, I, the, uh, I have the, the allspice ram that I love using over here. Uh, allspice oh, yeah. ram and and and, uh, and coke. Totally. So much fun. So and all the wines in the world. Coke. Yeah, I mean, what's the um, real secret to doing tiki tropical? Is yeah, juicy tropical, but you know, allspice with the bitters or allspice ram. Definitely a good option. Second question of, of the Taylor Taylor White Lightning Round: If you were not in the business. If you're not selling the gospel of uh, of cocktails, if you weren't in booze or in food at all, what would you do? What would your job be? I think a lot of people are thinking about that as they kind of reevaluate currently and find passions or what they're they're happy about. I find so much joy and happiness in not only running a business, but the business of helping people make drinks. It's just it's really rewarding. Um, I originally was a finance and business guy. Uh, it's kind of how I came into the small business world, fine with this passion. Uh, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, I actually love classic cars and, you know, recently sold an old BMW, but bought an old motorcycle. So I would find myself probably in the, the vintage car market, whether that would be, uh, probably not repairs, but more of the maybe auction or selling side, maybe finding those classic cars for all those wealthy folks, but uh, definitely love vintage automobiles, thrill of driving them, and that would be something I would, I'd love to do, possibly race them. A race car driver, that's what I would be. <laughs> <laughs> if I could do it. A race car yeah, driver, I, I think. Uh... Like that, European stuff, yeah. <laughs> Great question, think... Sam. Every, every other car I see on 495 seems like they also want to be a race car driver, so I think you're in good company. <laughs> I agree, yeah. Um, for our third question, we uh, I think we're gonna have uh, Phil come in here. He's got a he's got a complicated one for you. Get ready for this one. Phil's always tough. Oh boy. Okay, right, so this is this is an interesting one. So let's say you have about six hours. No, okay, let's give it twelve hours. You have twelve hours to hide a bottle of you know like let's say your 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 favorite spirit in the world or or say like a like a like a 20 year bottle of corona you're some, something fantastic something that you um are are excited about you have to hide it somewhere in the world yes boom <laughs> where would i hide this bottle if 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 you uh yeah if you can hide it somewhere in the world it, and it if if no one can find it within a week you get a, a lifetime supply of it Oh, wow. Now, where would you hide uh, that bottle? I have 12 hours to hide it. Uh, you know, the highest peak, the lowest the things. You know, I just tie it to a string and throw in the charles because nobody's supposed to go in there. So, seal it up, tie it to a string, put it off a pier, nobody's going to find it. Then when I'm ready, I'll just fish that bottle out, pop the cork, and have it. I don't need 12 hours. I'll just go down over here to... <laughs> <laughs> the Charles River. Nobody's going yeah. to the Charles, man. You can't find it there. Yeah, you know you're you're right. I, <laughs> completely sealed. Completely sealed. Nothing would be able to get into this bottle. I actually hid some rum. Well, I hid some rum once. Uh, well, I, I can tell you. Yeah, we hid it in a lighthouse off of Boston. We had a special lighthouse version of rum that we boy scouted some kegs of rum, and then we got those into the barrels, into this storage place, literally up at uh, Graves Lighthouse. So we took a boat out there, and yeah, you couldn't get there off unless you went into this random place. Uh, and it was amazing because we got some of the rum, but I will say sea or salt water will degrade a uh, the steel rings or on a barrel, a wooden cask or bourbon barrel pretty quick. So uh, just be oh, wary yeah. about keeping it in the open, put it that way. But yeah, you know, I, you know, if I could always find it, keep it close to home, you know, that way I can have it whenever I want it. 
The only problem is that if that uh, the, if the seawater gets in there, you get a lifetime supply. <laughs> Oh, oh boy! Oh, I don't need a lifetime supply of the Charles River. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! I'm checking online to see if anybody else out there has got some questions. If anybody's following along on Facebook, uh, make sure you ask a question. Um, the only question that anybody asked so far was about whether or not it was at six o'clock or eight o'clock. So everyone who's showing up at eight o'clock is going to be no disappointed. <laughs> uh, we're required, so we'll see you at eight. I will say one final thing for anybody looking into check out the Boston Shaker if you need any supplies. Uh, we're always here to help, and we are offering a discount uh, to promote our website to keep people shopping online. It's a free in-store pickup. Obviously, we do shipping nationwide. Uh, but right now, we're doing a discount, Shake 15, so S-H-A-K-E-1-5. If you're viewing your cart on our website, thebostonshaker.com, view your cart, type in the discount code Shake15, Shake15. And you'll save 15% off your whole order. And that's going until now to really, obviously, during this time to get people the supplies they need uh, the right way and as soon as possible. So if you guys are out there watching, check out thewashtaker.com. Save yourself some money. Get yourself the best parts tools. Awesome. Oh, and also, yeah, we got this, these new books in. I actually was going to feature uh, the Swizzle we found was, uh, one of them was from Easy Tiki, which is a brand new tiki book that, it's really approachable and meant for the home bartender. Uh, there's some local, uh, some featured cocktails in there that come from local establishments. Ryan Lotz from Shore Leave. Uh, actually, his swizzle, uh, the third wave swizzle, is featured in this book. So cool local bartenders, local restaurants, um, uh, making really approachable tiki drinks. So wide range of uh, books here as well for all that summer reading for people looking to learn more history on tiki or looking for some modern recipes. We, uh, we have four weeks to go over Tiki, and um, I hope that folks that are that are watching right now are are super excited. As you know, Lonnie, like half the work is is doing the research and reading up on all of the archaeology behind trying to figure out like what the hell is Don Mix number two, uh, yeah. what the hell rum yeah, he did his were they using in the thirties, and uh, it's it's. These books you have are, are perfect for that and um, highly recommended for anybody listening. Um, if there are no other questions on the, on Facebook or on the Internet, then I just want to thank Lonnie Newburn again once once uh, for, for the Boston Shaker. A, a huge round of applause for my man Lonnie. Had a great time with you, brother. And I, I, love, I love everything about the Boston Shaker. I love everything about what you're doing over there. Um, and I, I, I hope that folks are, um, you know, are excited to, to, to try some new syrups, some new drinks, read some more. And, and I can think of no better place to, yeah. to guide people than the Boston Shaker. Yeah, we're here. Phone, email, info at the Boston Shaker. Give us a call. I would say right now with people with the time on their hands, they're ready to take the time to make a good drink at home. And that's exactly what we're here for. So don't be afraid. Yeah, reach out to the Boston Shaker anytime. We're here to help. And that goes doubly for myself. If anyone has any questions, reach out to reach out to Lonnie, uh, reach out to me at, at Sam at TaylorWhiskey.com. And uh, other than that, I think uh, no, I think it's time to cut the feed, baby. Yeah, cut the feed. Thanks, cut Taylor. The Taylor feed. Team. Thanks for having us. We'll see you soon, Thanks. guys. Can't wait. Talk to you soon, babe.